There are not that many genuine rock legends of the 20th century left standing. David Bowie, Prince, Michael Jackson, many of them are gone. Among the towering figures left, I'm thinking Mick Jagger, Elton John, Bruce Springsteen, there's one who's arguably untouchable in the scale of his influence and audience, and that's former Beatle Paul McCartney. His Australian tours have been few and far between. The last one was 26 years ago, in fact. Paul McCartney turned 75 this year, and that means the tour he's just started in Australia could well be his last. I had the incredible opportunity to go backstage before McCartney's first Australian concert in Perth on the weekend to meet the man himself. For any Beatles fan, getting to do this goes beyond anything you could ever dream. I cannot believe I'm messing around on Paul McCartney's stage. He actually played uh, yesterday on uh, oh. this one here. Yes, Eddie. That's, well, that was what he played yesterday on uh, The Ed Sullivan Show. In, no way. In 1964 oh on TV. I couldn't even put a price on that guitar. That I don't think so, no. Wow. This is what we call the magical piano. Yeah. Well, well, no, 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 no. Oh my God, really? And then we need to line it up a little bit for him. Oh, there we go. Unfortunately, we already have a piano player. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Sweet. Really. And I get to watch the former Beatle prepare for opening night of his Australian tour. thrilling to make I'm very well it's sounding fantastic yeah thank you so you still no matter how experienced you are how much you played with these guys you still personally come in and do the sound check yourself yeah yeah you know it's nice to get the hang of the the stadium and it's nice to play with the band I just enjoy playing with them you look like you're having a lot of fun yeah we are do you still get nervous um, doing this I do no <laughs> not you know not really um, a little bit, sometimes at big events, or maybe like the start of a tour like this, a little bit nervous, but soon goes. But lots of people have anxiety dreams about their work. Do you ever find that you do? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, ever since I started performing, you always, there's like a recurring dream, which is, and I still have it to this day, which is um, you're in a stadium and you're playing, you know, with the Beatles or with the band, and people start leaving. And it's like, OK, what are we doing wrong? What's going on? And it's like, oh, quick! You know, we're trying to pull out the big one. Quick! <laughs> hey, Jude, quick! And they're still leaving. Quick, long, tall Sally, quick! And they're just drifting away, and you wake up in a cold sweat. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I'm glad to know it's not just me. I'm glad everyone has those kind of dreams. <laughs> yeah. How do you pick the set list for a concert? I mean, you've just got such a vast array of material to choose from. Yeah, you know what I do? I sit down first of all and think, um, if I was going to a Paul McCartney concert, what would I want to see? Uh, so I think of it from the point of view of the audience. And um, that, so I put down those numbers that I wouldn't want to interleave out, kind of thing. And then we sort of fill in from there with songs we want to do, songs that they don't want to hear. <laughs> but. Uh, no, you know, so I, I basically want to give the audience a good time, so I, I start that in the set list and uh, take it from there. That strikes me as an act of real generosity, because some of your songs you must have played tens of thousands of times. That's true. Um, you know what, though? The funny thing is, particularly these days, it's like I'm rediscovering them, because I'm singing them. And you don't just sing and think of nothing. So I'm thinking of all in the studio with the guys when we did it. I'm thinking of how I wrote it. And, and some of them, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it and thinking, this was a 24-year-old kid who wrote this, which happens to be me, but, you know, at 24, 
I'm thinking, this isn't bad. This is pretty good, you know. So that's what keeps you going. You, you, you're always hearing lines in the songs. Like, I wish. Oh, you do, you know, I feel like him, yeah. But then I look in the mirror in the morning and I'm not him. No, but I, you know, I think a lot of people have that experience. They sort of still feel like their young selves, you know. Um, so I do. Yeah, you know, it's, I still approach things kind of the same way. And I like to have a sense of wonder. I don't want to get too jaded, you know. So when I see the audience, you know, it's like, wow, audience, wow, they, they love it, you know. Their enthusiasm for it must give you a lot of life and a lot of energy. Yeah, it does, yeah. Uh, that's one of the reasons I, I do it, you know. People say, why do you do it? I said, we've come along to one of our shows to see the audience and see, feel that feeling coming off them. And it's very uh, inspiring and invigorating. And watching you with the band as well and that collaboration, I mean, you've had such wonderful collaborations in your career. It must be just wonderful to work with such high level musicians as well. Yeah, no, it is, you know. And we've been working quite a long time together, it's over 10 years now. Uh, so we're mates as well, we kind of know each other and, you know, we have a good time together. Don't seem to argue, strangely enough. <laughs> but um, we do, we enjoy each other's company, you know. And after the show, we get on the bus, we have a little bevy, fight to eat or something, we just talk about the show. So uh, it, it is good, that collaboration is great. Beatles songs have so much meaning for people. Does it ever become bothersome when people want to come up to you and say what a song has meant to them or they're very emotional about it? No, it's great. I mean, you know, you write a song kind of for yourself because it's a very magical process, you know. You write it and then you release it to the world and it is very special. You know, you, you think, God, where these things have been, you know, all over the world. And then I'll get letters from people saying, you know, I was very ill or my kid had cancer and all he did was play Beatle records and he's better now. So, you know, that kind of stuff is very emotional. And I don't think you ever get fed up with that. Are you so famous that, you know, you can't if you're here, if you want to go to the pub and have a beer, you want to nip out and buy your wife a present, can you do that or is that just too hard for you? Yeah, you know, I've kind of developed a strategy over the years where I'll do that and I'll go in and at first people, oh, 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 oh and everyone's reaching for the phone, oh, can we have a brand? I said, no, I'm going to look, it's a private time with me, I hope you don't mind, but let's not do anything, let's just hang out. And pretty soon everyone settles down and we're just talking, you know, on the drink, Macca, yeah. <laughs> What's it like when you're up here and, you know, as you will be on this Australian tour and you hear, you know, every person here sing along to Hey Jude or Yesterday? It's, it's really special and I think also in today's world where, you know, things can get a little bit fragmented and the news can be bad, you know, as we all know. Um, here, when we do that, when everyone's singing Hey Jude, it's like we've all joined together in, in a spirited way and we all don't care about the bad news. We're concentrating on this great little moment, you know. So it is very uh, heartwarming and it can be very emotional. You know, you can suddenly catch yourself go, whoa, it's great. Everyone's sort of prone to being reflective and that's completely fine, but I wonder, do you ever stop and just think, my God, you know, this life that I've had? Yeah, I do. And me, I'm this little kid who grew up in Liverpool, but I've sort of grown this big adult body on me. And when you're playing to a big show like this, a big concert, and all these people know me and like my songs, like you say, sing along, you do have to pinch yourself. You think, oh, yeah, this is still me. All right, come on, you're this guy now. And, um, it's great, but you do have to kind of not let, not get carried away with it. I sort of think, yeah, but you're still just that, that kid, you know. It's just, but um, it is an amazing thing, and I do love it. And I say, as long as you control it, you know. Uh, I used to do this even in the Beatles. You'd have the girls come screaming up. Um, I remember walking into a gig once, because I kind of like going on public transport and doing all these ordinary things, and it reminds me of just 
being down to earth. And all these girls come up to me. I say, okay, calm down. So I like treat it like I'm an elder brother. All right, girl, come on, look, what do you want? Your autograph, what do you want? Right Let's walk quietly along, and we'll talk, I'll do your autographs. Well, that's the deal. So I can, you can kind of control it, you know. Keeps that bit of perspective that what's yeah. important and what's real. And then, you know, because we all have a better experience. We're hanging with each other and we're walking along and I'm doing the other. Thing. So Paul, I have been very fortunate in my life that I've been allowed to interview world leaders, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi, the Dalai Lama, lots of celebrities, you know, Elton John, Patti Smith and everyone. I have never interviewed someone of whom I'm a bigger fan than you. Thank you for all of those songs and for making time to speak to us. It's just been so unbelievably thrilling. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Because I guess, come on. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck for the show tomorrow night. Cheers. <laughs> Thank right. you. We'll Thanks. let you get back to it.